Hello, my name is Christopher Lovejoy. I'm a junior doctor and a clinical data scientist working in London. And today we're talking about how AI may change the way we run intensive care units. I'm going to start by talking about the factors that affect the impact of AI on different medical specialities. I'm then going to talk about the ways that we might use artificial intelligence in the intensive care unit. I'll then talk about the challenges of introducing AI into intensive care. And then I'll finish with a few closing thoughts. AI is going to affect different specialities in different ways. The sum of the variation between different medical specialities affects how AI may be used. For example, radiology and pathology are two specialities that some people think will be replaced by AI, although that's another topic of debate. Today I'm going to focus on intensive care units. And for those of you not from a medical background, the intensive care unit is the place where people go when they are most unwell. And it's where you will have extensive monitoring with a high number of nurses and doctors looking after every patient. The patients will be connected up to monitors which analyze them continuously and check various different measurements. And it's the area where you often see medical dramas set with the machine in the background which is beeping and everyone looks pretty upset. For those of you less sure what I mean by when I say AI, I've made a long video, about an hour long, where I explain the key concepts of AI and how it can be used in medicine, and I delve a little bit into what AI actually is. I'm not going to be covering that in today's video, I'm just going to focus on how it might be used in the intensive care unit. Now before considering how AI is going to affect a speciality, it's important to consider what are the factors that determine the type of impact that it has. Now the first factor is data. Many of the applications of AI in healthcare need large volumes of high quality data. Different specialities use different amounts of data in their decisions and also use different types. Now in the intensive care units, because everybody is continuously monitored, they have regular blood tests, they have observations and vital signs taken very regularly. Many of them will be on heart monitors. All of these different measurements make up data. And from that data, we can extract meaningful information. And the second thing that's important to consider is decisions. So what type of decisions need to be made in that speciality and in what ways may AI help us make those decisions? Those might be decisions about a diagnosis. Does someone have one disease or another disease? And how likely is it that they have those? It might be decisions about treatment. What treatment should we give? What medication? What dose of that medication? And what should the next steps be? And there needs to be a way that that data can lead to improved decisions. So what are some of the ways that we might use the data in the intensive care unit to help us make these decisions? I'm going to talk about four main areas. First is prediction. The second is personalizing treatment. The third is support making decisions. The fourth is using new types of data. One of the difficult elements of treating patients in the intensive care unit can be predicting when they're going to deteriorate. For example, one common cause of deterioration is something called sepsis. So sepsis is when an infection in one part of your body spreads into the blood and then your body mounts a strong immune response to that infection and that causes you to become very, very unwell. There's high mortality rates associated with it and it's been described in media as the silent killer. But the tricky thing is it can be very hard to identify at the early stages and it only becomes more obvious once they start becoming unwell. Various different scores have been made to try and quantify how high risk someone is for developing sepsis so that we can respond appropriately. But actually AI may have the potential to develop models that can help us to predict sepsis and other types of deterioration at an earlier stage. And what would be useful with that is that then enables us to intervene at an earlier stage, which enables better outcomes to be obtained. And a few different groups have looked at doing this. One group found that their AI model could predict sepsis 12 hours before it actually developed. Another group found they were able to predict sepsis with a reasonable accuracy without actually using any blood tests. They only used what we call vital signs in America or observations in the UK, which includes blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, respiratory rates, and oxygen saturation. Now the benefit of that is it saves us having to wait for those blood tests so that we can then commence treatment earlier. When patients are in an intensive care unit, they often receive lots of different treatments in a short period of time. But the ways in which they respond to those treatments depends on their own individual physiology. Sometimes these effects are obvious and can be predicted, such as if you have a young patient versus an old patient, or an underweight patient versus an overweight patient. But often there's a lot of subtlety between different patients that actually is not easy for us to predict. And because multiple different treatments are given at similar times, it can make it difficult for us to quantify exactly what effects came from what treatments. AI may enable us to personalize treatments by identifying the different physiological ways in which patients may respond so that we can understand how the patient in front of us will respond to the treatment we decide to give. 
Because of the difficulty of performing standardized tests in the intensive care unit, because everybody is unique and responds in different ways and has multiple different treatments simultaneously, it makes it difficult for us to provide clear protocols on exactly the best treatment that we should do. And what that leads to is a fair amount of clinician variation because the decisions are guided by each clinician's own individual experience. And every clinician will have had slightly different experiences, which means that they opt for slightly different treatments. There's a couple of ways in which AI could be used to provide a standardized way of deciding what the best treatment is for each patient. One treatment where we see a lot of variation is the amount of IV fluids and the amount of what we call vasopressors given in people who have sepsis. So when someone has sepsis, we want to give a lot of fluids to go into their blood vessels, as well as vasopressors, which help to constrict those blood vessels to make sure that they maintain their circulation and can provide oxygen to their organs but there's a fair amount of variation in how much fluids and vasopressors are given by different clinicians. One recent study that was published in Nature looked at developing an AI model to decide how much IV fluids and how much vasopressors we should give to people who have sepsis. Their study found that we tend to give too much fluid and not enough vasopressors. They did a comparison by looking at the decisions of the AI model with the actions that were actually made, and they found that those people who made the decisions that were closest to the algorithm are the ones that had the best outcome. They found that when more or less IV fluids or vasopressors were given, the outcomes on average tended to be less good. So this could be a very useful tool for deciding doses. A second example where AI could help us to make decisions is with when deciding to remove a ventilator. If a patient becomes very, very sick and they're not able to maintain their own breathing, they might need the support of an artificial ventilator. And this is where a tube is placed down their throat and it's attached to a machine and that machine breathes for them. Then they spend some time where we treat their underlying cause but the tricky part is deciding when we should then remove that ventilator. If we remove it too early, the patient will become unwell and they'll have to have the ventilator reinserted. And when we remove it too late, it means that they've spent longer on intensive care than they should have and not breathing for themselves. And again, that might make it harder for them to recover but it can be very difficult to decide the most appropriate time to remove the ventilator. One study looked at using an AI to decide exactly when we should remove it, and it tended to recommend decisions that were better than the clinicians. And finally, there's ways we can use new type of data to improve the care on intensive care units. One study found that by collecting data from body sensors that patients were wearing, as well as audio recordings of the environment and video recordings, they could predict people who were at higher risk of developing delirium, and they could also detect that delirium at an earlier stage. Delirium is a condition that's more common in elderly people, and it often occurs when you're in an unfamiliar environment for a sustained period of time, as well as when you're unwell, and it's a state of confusion. So if we're able to detect patients who are developing delirium or who have delirium, we can then take measures to help them become less confused. Another study used sensors looking at the ways in which patients were lying in their beds in order to encourage them to be moved at the appropriate time so that they wouldn't develop bed sores. Bed sores are a common issue in patients who spend a lot of time lying down in the same position. Because our bodies aren't designed for us to apply pressure to the same area over a long period of time, when we do that, it can lead the skin to break down and you can develop ulcers, which can then become infected. And this is a common issue in hospitals, so we often take measures to prevent people from developing these sores. In intensive care, patients are particularly at risk because often they're not moving for many, many days. But using AI in order to detect this, we could encourage staff in the hospital to make sure the patients are moving at the appropriate times to prevent them from developing these bed sores. But of course, there are a few associated challenges of introducing AI into the intensive care units. So one issue in intensive care units that was highlighted by a doctor called Peter Pronovost is that often the machines that collect different data in the intensive care units don't communicate with each other. For example, the machine that measures observations doesn't communicate with the machine that carries the blood test results, that doesn't communicate with another machine collecting another type of data. And Peter Pronovost wrote about this in his book, Safe Patients, Smart Hospitals, which I would highly recommend, which also explores the ways in which he's tried to overcome this by encouraging encouraging this kind of integration of data. And I've talked a lot about the quality of data being important in this video. And another challenge for us to develop this high volume of high quality data that's required for these types of AI models is that sometimes data may not be entered correctly into systems. In busy, high stress environments, data entry can often feel like a less important task to be performing when the patient is in front of you and you want to be looking after them. And data entry is often left to nurses and to doctors who may be more focused on looking after the patients. 
and sometimes this can lead to errors being made in the data and inconsistent quality of that data, which hinders the ability for us to develop these kinds of AI models. However, many of the studies that I've talked about that have shown quite good accuracy and success in the intensive care units were actually developed in these kinds of environments where there was these kind of data quality challenges, so it can be done. So in summary, there's a lot of potential for AI to be used in the intensive care unit, predominantly because it's such a data-driven environment. These tools are going to help doctors to make their decisions, and it's also going to help with the monitoring of patients. I don't think that AI is going to replace doctors in the way that you might sometimes hear, and ultimately I think it will free up more time to focus on the higher level decisions that doctors can then use their experience to make. Intensive care doctors are often required to make life-changing decisions based on very complicated data. AI could convert this data into more actionable information, making it easier for us to make those decisions in a more evidence-based way, and enable doctors to com combine their experience and their human touch to deliver excellent care. That's everything for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. And I also wrote a bit more about this in an article that was published in the journal Critical Care. So if you're interested, check that out as well. A link will be in the description. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, leave them in the comments box below. Give this video a thumbs up. If you feel so inclined, consider subscribing.